All right, hi everybody. Um, good to see so many familiar faces, or names at least. <laughs> um, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge that this meeting is being hosted on uh, the traditional lands of the Bindal people and pay my respects to the elders past and present. Um, so today, we're very lucky to have the infamous Hugo Harrison giving us a presentation. He's a wonderful human who needs no introduction. Um, but for those that don't know, uh, he's a molecular ecologist uh, with an interest in coral reefs and mainly works on kind of movement ecology of reef organisms. Um, so according to his blurb, his main research is focused on understanding patterns of larval connectivity and the relevance and does, um, the re relevance they have to the design and effectiveness of marine protected areas. But I think what's really nice about his work is that it, it starts to integrate the importance of marine protected areas and no-take reserves with fisheries management, um, and also looks at them holistically. Um, I think there's a bit of a trap sometimes that we fall in with marine protected areas in general is that these are systems that have been brought from land, um, but in the ocean, they're, it's a very different system. There's um, a lot of larval movement that's happening that isn't happening on land, and those sorts of things need to be considered. Um, and in other fields as well, with some of the work I'm doing, marine reserves end up being a bit of a dirty word sometimes uh, on the fisheries side. But I think Hugo's work's been really good because it's shown that they can have fisheries benefits. Um, and I think that's really important. And that's, that's some of what he's gonna be talking about today. So without further ado, um, I'll turn it over to Hugo. Uh, thanks very much, Pat. Um, it's so nice to see some of the familiar faces today um, and uh, wish, could, wish I could be there in, in person to, to join you. And just before I, I start, I'd also like to acknowledge the Wupperbara people from the Keppel Island region, where much of the research we're gonna be talking about today has taken place uh, and I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And listen, this, this work takes me back a few years. It, it's obviously work that's remained uh, quite uh, close to me over the years. Um, and since we published a couple of papers in the last, uh, last year, I thought uh, this would be a good opportunity to, to share them with you and share them with the center more broadly. <clears throat> And so this is about the value of marine reserves for fish and fisheries, but really the, the title should, should perhaps be uh, about the people and the value of marine reserves for livelihoods. Because uh, millions of people around the world uh, rely heavily on the productivity of, of coral reefs for their livelihoods. Around 37 million people are employed directly by small scale fisheries around the, the tropics and another 100 million people are employed in what is a multi-billion dollar industry, which in, in large part goes to feed Asia. And even in Australia on the Great Barrier Reef, you know, most, of the, most of the fish caught are exported live to fish markets in Hong Kong. And so coral reef fisheries are a huge market. And for many fish are the only, uh, uh, one of the, the few sources of protein uh, available to them. And so communities are organized around fishing activities and you know, traditions and cultures throughout the Indo-Pacific are built around our connection to the sea. And our livelihoods uh, can depend quite heavily on preserving this connection and, and preserving those fisheries. <clears throat> and how we fish and how, or how we regulate fisheries uh, varies uh, around the world, but there are a few common friend, trends. We're fishing further and further from ports. We're spending more time to catch the same amount of fish. And we're pulling out more and more fish. And to add to this problem, we're not just feeding off coral fish. We're also damaging the reef habitats these fisheries rely on, either directly through pollution and land clearing, or indirectly through, through climate change, uh, which has already uh, affected every coral reef in the world in one way or another. And these impacts affect not only the productivity of reefs, but also the sustainability of coral reef fisheries. And so there's an enormous international effort to now protect coral reefs from further degradation. And so the question I have for you today is how do we balance our conservation goals and the preservation of coral reefs with the need to feed millions of people around the world? 
And what I'd like to argue is that these objectives are not necessarily two separate things. If fish populations depend on, depend on having healthy reefs, then conservation is intrinsic to how we should manage fisheries. And by making fisheries sustainable, uh, we should also be able to protect reefs from some of the threats that they're facing. And this idea is by no means novel. In the early 1900s, we had a French fisheries scientist by the name of Marcel Iribel, who remarked that uh, where fish were given asylum, uh, these areas would have giant congregations of fish competing with each other and driving fish out of these protected areas. And so he proposed that by protecting areas where fish naturally spawn, fish would multiply and grow and seed nurseries of young, young fish. Now, Eribel was perhaps the first proponent of using what we now call marine protected areas as a management tool to protect fish spawning stocks. But this idea really didn't gain much traction. And in fact, the value of marine protected areas in fisheries management is still something that is heavily debated today. And even though this debate might be ongoing, there's been a huge international effort to protect the ocean, largely to protect biodiversity and minimize some of the impacts we have on the marine environment. And so today we have about seven and a half percent of the world's oceans now protected inside of these marine protected areas or other effective area-based management. Um, and and the, the, uh, the first um, MPAs were really established in the 1960s, and it wasn't until the, the early 90s that we had the first international treaty to encourage nations to protect coastal, coastal regions. In 2002, the Commission on, on Biological Diversity developed goals that committed countries to protect 10% of the oceans by 2010. These targets were pushed back to 2020, and even though we still failed uh, we, to meet those targets, we seem to be doubling down on our efforts. And we, we, uh, we're expecting that at COP15 in May next year, nations will commit to have 30% of global oceans protected by 2030 using a combination of MPAs with varying, varying levels of protection from marine, for marine ecosystems and, and of course other area-based conservation measures. And now historically, marine protected areas were created as sanctuaries to present the loss of biodiversity, but really what that means is to minimize the impact that we have on the marine environment. And, and this drive to protect our ocean comes from, from the top, of course, from governments who recognize the need to protect the environment, but also from the bottom, from communities who want to protect their coast, who want to protect their culture and the resources and services that they, they provide. But it's rare that an MPA uh, or the MPAs in general are considered as a tool to sustain fisheries. And I think this is a problem. So if we prioritize the conservation of biodiversity and stop people from fishing, we risk affecting the needs of millions of people who depend on the marine environment for their livelihoods. If on the other hand, we prioritize fisheries objectives and protect livelihoods, we risk continued degradation of the marine environment by watering down legislation and placing reserves where they are either ineffective or have little environmental impact. So if we want to protect our marine environment and eat it too, we have to recognize that protecting biodiversity can also support fisheries and livelihoods. In fact, we may need to implement reserves in a way that will support fisheries in order to protect biodiversity. And so perhaps the only way we we can have coral reefs and sustainable fisheries depends on whether Heribel was right that by protecting our most productive spawning stocks in no-take zones, we not only ensure the sustainability of fisheries, but we also gain the many ecological and socioeconomic benefits of marine protected areas. And so intuitively, Iribel's ideas make sense, but it really comes down to what this larval fish does in her first 28 days. As you see her now, this larval coral trout just spent 28 days swimming in the open ocean, where she's developed the capacity to swim, to see, to smell, to hear, and use these senses to navigate to a new home, to a new reef. And over those 28 days, she could have swum tens, if not hundreds of kilometers, but of course, she's too small for us to track. And so we really have no idea where she's come from. And if we don't know where she's come from, then we have no idea how 
fish populations are replenished or how to manage uh, fisheries effectively. And so the central question as to whether we can use marine reserves and fisheries comes down to this simple question. Essentially, where do fish come from? And 20 years ago, and certainly in the time of Eriveil, the widely held dogma was that they come from far and wide, and it doesn't really matter where they come from as long as they keep coming. But over the years, we've come to realize that dispersal is a lot more constrained, both in time and space. And so this takes us back a bit uh, to the Keppel Islands, where you know, my journey at JCU began. And he, here, as with the rest of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, a third of all coral reefs are protected by these no-take zones, um, areas where we're not allowed to fish. And the objective of these no-take zones are to protect the heritage values of the Great Barrier Reef, including preserving biodiversity. And as a bonus, you also end up having more fish, uh, particularly of species that were previously expo exploited. And this is where you encounter the the sometimes irrefutable argument that has plagued marine conservation for decades, what's the point of having more fish if you can't catch them? And so the million dollar question at the time was whether these protected populations, these protected fish, could also help seed and support neighboring fish, fisheries beyond these reserve boundaries, and particularly for the highly prized coral trout, which are the number one fish on the Great Barrier Reef. And so this is our, our main protagonist for today. It's everyone's favorite fish. It's a top predator on the reef and it's a curious, curious fish as well. So it's also a favorite with spearfishes. And that's why it's largely overfished throughout the Indo-Pacific, Indo so much so that in many parts it's considered locally extinct. Thankfully enough on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, our coral trout populations are pretty healthy. And so one of the main difficulties uh, or many difficulties in managing coral reef fisheries like coral trout is that they have a bipartite life, life history. It's basically the, the worst parenting you've ever heard of. Parents stay close to home, make lots of babies, release them into the environment, no parent, parental care needed. And this zero responsibility parenting is what makes it really hard to regulate fisheries year to year because we have no idea what happens to the offspring. We don't know where they go. Uh, we don't know uh, what they do uh, other than disperse in the open ocean for somewhere around 28 days. And during this time, they can really go anywhere. Um, but it, you know, it's not necessarily rocket science. If you stop fishing, you have more fish, you have bigger fish, they, re they produce more babies. And using parentage analysis, we could demonstrate that many of their offspring actually remained close to home and replenished nearby fishery. And this work was really instrumental in demonstrating the value of marine reserves, not simply as a tool for conservation, but as a fisheries management strategy as well. But the question is, is this enough? Is it enough to convince fishers to implement reserves or even stop them from wanting to reopen existing reserves to fishing? You know, if I'm a fisher, or if I'm in charge of managing a fishery, I want to know that if I close an area for fishing, there will be a net benefit to the fishery. And, and if my livelihood really depends on it, as it does for millions of people around the world, can I trust that closing a reef from fishing will reliably put food on the table? I think this is one of the million dollar questions of today. Can, can, we, rely, can we rely on marine reserves or or other conservation strategies to protect my marine biodiversity, restore fisheries and, and keep feeding the world. And, and if we are to implement reserves to help manage fisheries, it's important that we understand the value that they have to the fisheries and treat their larval contributions as a resource. And this is where I think we can take a maxim from the, the most cunning of merchants, the merchant of of, of Venice. And in the Merchant of Venice, Antonio knew that a diversified trade would hit, bring him many riches. And so Shakespeare wrote, my ventures are not in one bottom trusted, nor to one place, nor is my whole estate upon the fortunes of this present year. Therefore, my merchandise make me not sad. And Shakespeare understood that a diversified portfolio could lead to better returns and fortunes. Uh, and fortunes were not made from one place or a single asset, but with time. And I'm not necessarily one for theatrics, but essentially what Antonio is saying is that you know, my ventures are, are the best performers, 
diversified depend on long-term trends and therefore my reserves make a lot of fish. And this makes intuitive sense. And, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And so we can look at the performance of marine reserves through this lens of economics and risk mitigations. And the basis for this is Harry Markowitz 1952 thesis on portfolio economics, which says that the performance of two stocks when correlated through time will lead to volatility and high risk of, of returns in their combined performance. And we can see that the yellow and green stocks here are in synchrony. If one goes down, the other goes, uh, goes down too. Uh, uh, and they're essentially in, in synchrony. And this is the impact of COVID on, uh, on, on, on stocks uh, in the past 18 months. Um, you can see they've recovered well in some cases. But when we look at their combined performance, if you had invested in both of those stocks, their combined performance while it has grown is much more volatile, volatile than each individual stock, meaning that it is a risky investment. Um, and in the context of reserves, if their contribution to fisheries is driven by external factors, environmental factors, which we believe they are, it can lead to good and bad years and, and large fluctuation in their performance and therefore large fluctuation in recruitment um, and fisheries yields. If on the other hand, uh, performance is uncorrelated as one goes up, the other goes down, their combined performance provides more stable returns than each of the individual stocks alone. And having this portfolio can mitigate against fluctuations due to external factors. And so having a portfolio can buffer against market shocks in bad years, leading to more consistent and stable returns. And so, and so therefore, by extension, uh, more stable, more consistent and stable recruitment and fishery yields. And we can apply these same principles to the performance of marine reserves to ask whether larval subsidies from reserves are consistent and reliable. Uh, but to do this, we need to be able to track the performance and trends of uh, marine reserves. And this is where we come back to the Keppels. Now, some of you will know this quite well because you were there. We had two major sampling efforts in the Keppels. Uh, the first back in 2007, 2008, the second 2011, 2013. And over that entire period, we captured uh, over a thousand juvenile fish uh, throughout the island group and over 1500 uh, adult coral trout from four reefs in no tick areas. And each fish was, was genotyped with the same set of markers uh, to attain their DNA profile. So we could do the parentage analysis, uh, analysis. And juvenile fish were aged from their otoliths so that we could determine uh, the, the time when each fish would, was spawned. And this allowed us to, uh, to identify uh, six discrete cohorts, uh, three successive cohorts in the two periods that each span just over a year. And so using parentage analysis for each of, within each of these cohorts, we ask, did any of these juveniles fish from, can it come from any of our reserve? And so we assigned 125 uh, juvenile fish back to, uh, back to parents in each of the four reefs in no tick zones across the six different, uh, different cohorts. And so this allowed us to look at how, um, to look at the performance of reserves through these successive cohorts. And so knowing where and when juveniles were collected um, allowed us first to uh, establish the dispersal patterns from each of these co the, the cohorts we sampled. And here, each reef in the Keppels is, is denoted by a node uh, with the four focal reefs in color and colored lines representing the assigned juveniles that dispersed from one uh, no take zone uh, to a uh, to another reef, and we see that across these six different uh, cohorts uh, that we see here, uh, that dispersal patterns are complex. They vary, um, and they vary quite substantially among different the different cohorts, showing no real consistent trend or single underlying structure among these different dispersal networks. <clears throat> 
essentially no network is the same, which suggests that connectivity patterns across this seascape are extremely variable. And there's no reason to expect that they wouldn't be. Oceanographic uh, processes and the behavioral characteristics of larval fish introduces this extreme randomness into the, the fate of larvae. And so by extension, we would expect that the performance of no-take zones, uh, how much they contribute to local recruitment would be just as volatile. And this, this can be an issue. Why implement no-take reserves if the recruitment contribution you get uh, from them is essentially uh, random. And so we can, we can measure the performance of each of these reserves and how much they contribute to local recruitment. And, and we see that not all reserves necessarily contribute equally uh, and their contribution varies through time. So here, for example, we start by looking at the, uh, how much uh, middle, middle Island contributes to uh, all recruitment uh, in the in the Keppel Islands, uh, in each of these individual cohorts, and on average, Middle Island generates about five percent of all juvenile fish that recruit to the island group, uh, with a standard deviation around that of three percent, which is, you know, is not particularly large contribution, um, uh, and it's not particularly variable either. If we look at the other reserves we can see uh, that the performance of a single reserve can be quite uh, volatile, particularly in some of these top performers. And this makes sense. Dispersal is inherently volatile, so we should also expect the contribution reserves to be volatile. But their performance, what we found is that the performance is also asynchronous, meaning that the performance of a single reserve is independent of the performance of another reserve. And this is, in fact, Good news. It means that we can identify an, a, a portfolio that maximizes the overall recruitment return of this reserve network. And so when we consider all these reserves, com the combined performance of the reserve network, we can see that these four reefs are gener generating a whopping 41% of all recruitment in the island group. So these four, four reefs that represent 14% uh, of all coral reef area in, uh, in the Keppel Islands are generating you know, well over a third of, of all recruitment in the island group. And, and it sort of makes sense, the more protected stocks you have, the, the better the returns, of course. Um, and so having a network of reserves is, seems like a good idea, but it still seems quite volatile in their return. The question is, is it more volatile than what you might expect given the areas of reef that is protected? And so this is where uh, Taylor's power law comes in, which says that the variance increases with the mean. And in, in ecology, this means that the bigger populations are more variable through times uh, than, than small population. In finance, it means that stocks of greater value are also more volatile. Uh, for us, in the context of marine reserves, it means that the more a reef contributes to uh, recruitment, the more variable its contribution, contribution will be from cohort to cohort. Uh, and this seems to hold true for our four reefs in the Keppel Islands. So if we imagine a single reef with the best performance equal to the sum of all reserves in the, in the Keppels, we would, we would expect it to have a certain variance. But the observed variance that we have from our four reefs is in fact lower. And this is what we call a portfolio effect. Essentially, what this says is that asynchrony in the performance of the four reserve reefs reduces the overall volatility in their performance. And the more reefs you have contributing to recruitment, the greater the stability uh, in, their, in their contribution, particularly if you have reefs that are contributing lots. Um, and so by having more fish, by having bigger fish who produce uh, more babies, and by having a network of reserves 
who work together to minimize the uh, so they work together to minimize the risk of, uh, to, of, of overfishing and mitigate against these fluctuations in the replenishment of fisheries. In other words, you know, there's safety in numbers. You can't simply have a single marine reserves. There are benefits to having a, a network of, of marine reserves. But that's not all. The, the, you know, the goal now is to figure out why some of these reserves uh, are also performing better than others. And, and identify some of the drivers of, of reserve performance. And so we know, of course, that fish are bigger in reserves. And since uh, reproductive output also increases hyper, hyper, hyper allometrically with age, you, you would expect that this, this would matter. And, and this is where the term BOFS comes in, which is a fisheries term, simply to uh, simply meaning that um, some of the bigger fish have a higher uh, reproductive output, particularly female fish. And so these are really important for us to protect. But the question is whether or not these larger fish uh, with higher reproductive output uh, also have a higher reproductive success. So do bigger fish also contribute more to, uh, to recruitment on, in the Keppel Islands on a per capita basis? And so this is work that I did with um, um, a master's student at JCU, uh, Charles Lavin, who's uh, now in, uh, in Norway, um, doing his PhD. And so we showed that, so we looked at, you know, uh, who, not where the larvae were going, but who we were assigning these juveniles to. And uh, we, we, we assign juveniles to fish across the broad spectrum of, of uh, adult coral trout that we sample from very small fish, 25 centimeters, in the area of 25 centimeters, to very large fish as well, up to 80 centimeters. Um, and we showed that, yes, you know, if we account for the distribution of fish that we assigned to and the distribution of fish that we had sampled, the reproductive success increases with fish size. We, we assigned a lot of juveniles to larger fish relative to how, um, how many we had sampled. Um, and we didn't sample a lot of these big fish, but we did assign quite a few fish to them, which suggests that, you know, which shows us that yes, you know, the, 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 the bigger you are, the more likely you are to, to contribute to, uh, to, to local recruitment, which is, which sort of makes sense. But, you know, these large fish are also rare. And so even, a reserve, even in reserves, it's <clears throat> even in, res in reserves in the Keppels, you know, these, uh, these larger fish are, are, can be particularly scarce. And so we see here on, on the left, the distribution of the size frequency distribution of fish across all the, all the reserves that we've sampled. And if we account for the size distribution of fish in reserves and their relative reproductive success, we see that the bulk of recruitment is actually coming from some of these uh, more abundant uh, but less fertile, uh, smaller fish. And so this is, uh, this is uh, you know, it's in fact the, the numerous young mature female fish. Uh, so these younger females that are, that are generating the greatest contribution to, uh, to local recruitment and provides the strong support for the minimum size limits to protect spawning stocks of coral trout on the Great Barrier Reef. I think, um, and so you know, we sort of came up with this this acronym to uh, to 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 contrast with the with the, the boss, um, and, and and simply to highlight that some of these smaller fish are quite important uh, as well, simply based on their sheer abundance. However, I think it's also uh, you know one important caveat to this is to remember that that no takes marine reserves are really the only management strategy that we have that preserves the full size structure of fish populations. And so you may, uh, you, you may not expect that the smaller fish in fished areas have the same reproductive output in the absence uh, of uh, some of those larger, larger, larger male fish. And so in fact, it might not simply be 
the, the abundance of these smaller fish that matters, but the overall size distribution of fish populations in the reserves that make, what make the, most, uh, the most difference. And so simply to, to, to recap, we have a greater biomass of coral trout in no take zones. They're making a substantial contribution to replenishment of fish. And in doing so, they create value for fisheries. The contribution reserves make to the replenishment of populations can be substantial, but also, be, um, but also the more they contribute, the more volatile it becomes. So we can't simply rely on having some of these big reserves, um, but uh, well, you know, having a single big reserves, we, uh, we can, but we can mitigate against the volatility and larval replenishment and mitigate the risk of, of recruitment, uh, recruitment failure by having multiple smaller reserves that uh, work together uh, as a network. Uh, and so where they you know, collectively provide a reliable and more consistent supply to local fisheries. And you know, I think that if done right, these reserves you know, can generate a huge value to, uh, to, to fisheries uh, to then support the livelihoods um, and uh, of the people who depend on them, and uh, at the same time support some of our you know, conservation targets. Um, and listen, I'd just like to to finish by uh, by thanking all those who have been involved in the work that we've done in the Keppels over the years, uh, and great to see a few of you here as well. Uh, I'd like, particularly like to thank uh, Jeff Jones, Dave Williamson, Mike Bird, uh, Michael Berriment, and Charles, La uh, Charles Lavin, who uh, joined me in co-authoring these, uh, these recent studies, uh, and all of uh, those who have helped to fund this work uh, over the years, and particularly the, the Center of Excellence for Coral Reef Studies. Um, and I think we've got plenty of time for questions, so I'm more than happy to 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 front any questions if you if you have any.